Have you ever seen anything like this before in your life? Chances are your answer is no. It looks remarkably peculiar, akin to something you might witness in a treasure hunt movie. But here's the catch. It's real. The Ethiopian Bible stands as one of the most enigmatic and contentious books to have ever existed. Even the country itself is veiled in mysteries that defy explanation, but that's a tale for another time. Ethiopia boasts one of the oldest civilizations globally and holds the distinction of being the sole African nation never colonized. As a result, its lineage can be traced back to Ham, one of Noah's sons. This lineage has even been corroborated by Jewish sources. However, this video doesn't focus on the country itself, but rather on its remarkable possessions. Ethiopia boasts some of the most ancient Bible scrolls known to humanity, surpassing even the renowned KJV Bible in antiquity. Unlike the 66 books comprising the King James Bible, the Ethiopic Bible contains a staggering 88 books, including works not found in other church canons. These scrolls encompass texts from both the Old and New Testaments, as well as previously unseen writings. What adds to the intrigue is that Ethiopia possessed these scrolls long before Christianity arrived in the 4th century. Unlike many nations where Christianity was introduced as a foreign religion, Ethiopia's history suggests Christianity was ingrained in its society from ancient times. Since the 4th century, Ethiopia has stood as a bastion of Christianity. Accounts from Egyptian traveler, monk, and historian Cosmas Indicopleustes indicate that Ethiopia embraced Christianity long before his visit in the middle of the 6th century. He witnessed how Ethiopian rulers welcomed numerous Christian refugees fleeing persecution from kingdoms and empires hostile to Christianity. Certain Ethiopian tribes have been venerating the Christian deity for over 3,500 years, making Ethiopia home to one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. Surprisingly, the oldest organized Christian body isn't the Catholic ministry as commonly assumed. Instead, it's the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, locally known as Tewahedo in Ethiopia. Adding to Ethiopia's Christian legacy, is the discovery of one of the earliest illustrated Christian books. This ancient text, part of the Gospels written in Gaez, an old Ethiopian language, was unearthed in 2010 in a monastery atop a mountain in Ethiopia. According to the Kibra Nagast, which is an Ethiopia's holy book, in the 10th century BC, an Ethiopian ruler and the famous biblical queen of Sheba went to Jerusalem to ask the famous King Solomon for advice. It's even recorded in the acceptable Bible canon. But what the Bible didn't tell us is that the two rulers had a son together named Menelik. Queen Sheba took the boy back to Ethiopia and made him the first emperor. In 2012, experts looked at the genetic makeup of many Ethiopians and found some evidence to support Sheba's journey to Jerusalem and birth there. In such, it is believed that Egyptian, Israeli, or Syrian people may have mixed with the Ethiopian natives around 3,000 years ago, during the time when the queen is said to have ruled the kingdom of Sheba, collaborating the story even further. Despite having all these credentials and authenticity, the Ethiopian Bible is still discarded and not taken as part of the canon of the holy books. In fact, most people, including believers of the same faith, have never heard of the Ethiopian Bible. This serves to underscore the concerted effort made to discredit and conceal the Ethiopian Bible. This prompts the question, why? To comprehend this, let's delve into a brief history lesson. The contemporary Bible differs significantly from its historical counterparts. In the past, there existed numerous versions of various Bible passages, along with diverse interpretations and understandings of its contents. As we all know, the Bible texts were originally written in Hebrew before being translated to other languages. 
The first translation was done by a man known as Saint Jerome from Hebrew to Latin. He was responsible for putting together what is known as the Vulgate around the year 400. And the Vulgate still remains the principal Latin version or the translation of the Bible. It had 27 books called the New Testament and 39 books called the Old Testament. At that time, it was called the Hebrew Bible. You see, in the first century, many books were written about Jesus' life and teachings. However, many of them were not true. These were like fan fiction novels of the account of Jesus' life. The issue arose when these books were written and released to the public. The public ended up believing those fan fiction books were actually real. There was no internet to quickly fact check these books. And as we know, fake news travels faster than real news. So you can only imagine the scores of fake books that were in society and the damage it did. This became a worry for leaders in the early Christian church. They met at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD and the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD to choose which books would be added to the New Testament. They determined that a book was scripture if it was written by one of Jesus' followers or someone who saw him teach. Additionally, the book also had to have been written in the first century and make sense with the rest of the Bible. There have been many changes to what we now call the Holy Bible, but the most important change may have happened during the reign of King James I. Despite the Vulgate existing for about 500 years, there were still numerous versions and accounts of the Bible, so much that it bothered the reigning monarch at that time. He was worried about the different Bible versions that were popular in the 1600s. The king wanted a version of the Bible that settled religious differences, as well as one that reinforced his power. Several priests also asked the king to make changes, saying that some of the translations that were going around were wrong. To solve this pressing issue, the king got 47 experts to look over all the different translations of the Bible that were already out there. They were split into six groups and worked on different parts of the project on their own for seven years. These men had to follow strict rules so that they wouldn't show any bias. They employed various methods to create a scholarly Bible and also used a number of different tools to help them make a scientific Bible that stayed true to the original languages. When the priest and the king looked at the works of these experts and saw that they had similarities in their work, despite being far from each other, they approved it, giving glory to God for guiding them to arrive at the same conclusion. In 1611, the King James Bible was published, and because of advancements made in printing, it became one of the most accessible Bible versions to date. So these edits made in the King James Bible and the original Vulgate translation made by St. Jerome saw to it that some books were not included in the Bible most Christians have today, while the Ethiopian Bible still retains all scripture. Now that we've delved into a brief overview of the Bible's history, it's time to address the central question of why the Ethiopian Bible faced rejection. There are numerous factors contributing to the non-acceptance of the Ethiopian Bible, but the primary reason is due to the Ethiopian Bible includes additional books known as pseudo-epigraphs. Pseudepigrapha are falsely attributed works, texts whose claimed author is not the true author, or works whose real author attributed it to a figure of the past, like fan fiction. Pseudepigrapha are considered non-canonical by most other Christian traditions. The books that were removed or rejected were ones that scribes and theologians of the time already knew were not divinely inspired. Many people before and after Jesus wrote these books with evil intentions, and I understand their reasons for removal. Take for example, if someone today released a book and said Kobe Bryant isn't a great athlete, the book would be a great failure, and the author would receive lots of backlash because we know that is false. But give that book 500 years, and when someone in that timeline sees that book, people in that era could start to think that Kobe Bryant do actually suck. So to prevent such lies from spreading into the future, we root it out now. 
Now even the Ethiopian Bible has two canons, the broader and narrow canon. Before delving into it, let me first define what a canon is. A canon is a generally accepted law, rule, principle, or criterion by which something is judged. So with that in mind, it's canon for a phone to have one screen, a country one president, this channel, more subscribers. The broader and famous canon has 81 books. In this popular version, we have Enoch, the Jubilees, the three books by Maccabees, Epistle to Clement, four books of Synodos, and a whole lot more. This is the main one of the video and the one that has garnered some attention. The narrow canon, on the other hand, was overseen by Emperor Haile Selassie. He created the narrow version and publicly proclaimed that this was the official and completed version of the Ethiopian Bible. The reason for this, unfortunately, I can't say because it might cause a misunderstanding and a war in the comments section, but all I will say is, look him up on the internet and do your research and see the truth for yourself. The narrow canon version doesn't have some scriptures that are found in the broader version. It just has 72 books in it. While the broader canon has everything the narrow canon has and more, the broader canon has not been reprinted since the early 20th century. So already you can see that even within itself there were already controversies. And having two different versions could also contribute to it not being accepted. The Ethiopian canon is a great way to see how the Bible has changed over time. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible isn't just one book. It's more of a collection of texts and experiences written over many years. And that's where the problem kind of lies. Different religious groups, including the verified or accepted ones, have a long history of excluding or including different texts or copies based on different theological slash personal grounds. For example, the Bible we know today was mostly written in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. During that period, the practice of Christianity in Ethiopia had already started to diverge from the expressions of Christianity observed in Europe and the neighboring regions of the Mediterranean. And to date, the difference keeps getting wider. The Ethiopian Bible has a lot of similarities with the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, although it does have a few extra Old Testament books. These were probably written in the last few hundred years BC, which is late in the time of the Old Testament books, but before the New Testament began. Additional books were added to the end of the New Testament after the rest of it was written. These additional books particularly talk about the history and structure of the Ethiopian Church. Another reason for the Ethiopian Bible being rejected could be because of the language it is written in. The Ethiopian Bible was written in Giz, making it difficult for non-speakers to access. Plus, the lack of translations and unique practices of the Ethiopian Bible have contributed to its relative obscurity outside of Ethiopia. The third reason is more controversial and is because of politics. During the nascent days of Christianity, the Roman Emperor prioritized political power over spiritual development, and power in politics was what the Roman Emperor really cared about during the early days of Christianity, not spiritual growth. So any scrolls that didn't fit with their preferred story were left out. In fact, the Bishop of Rome told the priests to destroy the scrolls that weren't in the Bible. But the priests were smart and hid many of them in vats that were found near the Dead Sea in the 1940s, which would explain the differences between both Bibles, as one version tend to have a quote-unquote complete version of the Bible and the other version have what man deemed to be all right. But in recent years, people have become more interested in the Ethiopian Bible, trying to find out what makes it special and the truth it holds. As Ethiopian churches continue their efforts to translate the Bible into more languages and doing academic studies on it. Personally, I think it is amazing that this Bible survived this long, as physically after the country was attacked by Muslims and Italy, and after a fire burned the church of the monastery where the Bible was in the 1930s. And it survived it all, adding to the mystery of this book.
In conclusion, it's truly remarkable how the Ethiopian Bible has endured through centuries of challenges, including attacks by Muslims and Italy, as well as a fire that engulfed the church of the monastery where the Bible was housed in the 1930s. This resilience adds to the mystery and significance of this ancient text. We'd love to hear your thoughts on all of this. If you're Ethiopian or have insights to share, please let us know in the comment section below. This video was suggested by a random subscriber, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to delve into such intriguing knowledge. As someone not deeply versed in biblical scholarship, I found the discussion about Ham and other aspects fascinating. Share your opinions in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Regardless of race or background, Jesus' message of love and redemption is universal. Join us on a journey of faith and entrepreneurship by clicking the link in the description below. Together, let's pursue success without losing sight of our spiritual values. Thank you for watching.